I want to introduce someone very special, Katrina Daniels Lee. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I want to thank you for being here. This is a very important event. And Joe, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Katrina Daniels Lee, and I am the founder of the Lee Paz Foundation. It's a nonprofit worldwide organization that I started over a year ago. My foundation that we put together is one of the largest support groups in the United States. Now, down to business. I need my glasses for this one because we're blind. About our special guest, Dr. Darnell. Dr. Douglas Darnell has appeared in court on over 100 cases in 11 states involving issues of custody, parental alienation syndrome, parental alienation, and other forensic matters. He has appeared on the Montel Show and Court TV, and references to his work have been profiled in over 50 news newspaper articles. Dr. Douglas has given presentation at both state and national conferences, including the Missouri State Bar, North Dakota State Bar Associations, AFCC, Children's Rights Council, and local and state bar associations addressing visitation of alienation and parenting. His publications have appeared in various scientific and professional journals. So with that, everybody give him a round of applause for a very special man. You know, in the last 10, 12 years since I have become more active and since the publication of my book, some very scary things have been happening. In all of the history of psychology, when there has been new theoretical developments, new identification of problem areas, I've never seen a situation where there has been such a violent attack to the theorists and the practitioners as I have seen in regard to this parental alienation. You know, for you professionals, Carl Rogers didn't get attacked. You know, Fritz Perls, well, he kind of got attacked. But you know, these professionals, th this is all part of the evolution of science, is developing theories and research and, and working with practitioners to try to better people's lives. What I appreciate, in a funny way, is we have a battlefield that none of us professionals, whether it's attorneys, accountants, psychologists, we have not asked for this. And it's become a very dangerous battlefield. We were talking about this in lunch in terms of the ethics complaints. I've had to fight ethics complaints. Uh, Dr. Bo has mentioned in a recent uh, survey that 54% of all psychologists having dealt with custody evaluations have had to deal with either malpractice or custody complaints. In effect, yes, we make a living, but we're also putting our professional lives at stake for something we believe. What I would like is all of you to applaud the professionals that are putting their careers online for you parents. They know that you appreciate everything they're doing. But we have a long ways to go because in a lot of ways, we're dealing with some of the most dangerous people that we can ever imagine. Let me tell you a little story. This young lady came to me, and, and she did have custody with her 13-year-old uh, daughter. And her husband was a stalker, and he kept bringing her back into court. And she had to get a, a, an apartment that was part of a house. You know, in a lot of older neighborhoods, they take houses and break them into duplexes. So one family lives upstairs and another family lives downstairs. And 
the, there, there was this persistent reaching out on the part of the father. And she became a little bit frightened. And like any reasonable person, at night she would lock the doors and um, kind of go on with life. And then she found that when she and her daughter, her daughter would go to school and, and she would go to work, she would come home and find food taken out of the refrigerator. She would find crumbs of cookies on the counter. And she didn't understand this. She replaced the locks on the door. She put uh, security bars on the windows. And nonetheless, the food continued to disappear. Crumbs. She could see urine on the side of the toilet. And obviously, she was terrified. How was this happening? One night, the, doctor, the, the doors were locked. She was in bed, and her daughter was in the next room. And here comes her ex-husband into the bedroom. And he raped her. And she knew that she had to contain all of her feelings, all of the fear, for fear of waking her daughter. If you can imagine that. So the big question is, where is he coming from? Where is he? And this is a true story. Well, she had a boyfriend. And they decided to, uh, they, they had one of these uh, drop stairways in, in the hallway, you know, that come down from the ceiling, and then you can go up into the crawl space. And for whatever reason, he decided to pull this thing down, go in the crawl space. And she found a mattress. She found uh, uh, wrappings from potato chips and things like that. And she found out, in effect, this guy had been coming from the outside, living up in the attic space, listening to everything she did, and then would come down. And that's how he got in the house. Now, that's a true story. But it shows you the extent that some people that we have to work with will go through in terms of creating terror, including stalking. And the issue that comes up, and, and we heard about this, you know, is again, and I'm going to address it, what do you do about some of this? I thought Brian's discussion about accounting was fascinating. Jane is creating a new paradigm in terms of creating change. Michael Bone is creating and looking at research kind of from a neuro-linguistic point of view. We're getting all of these different theories. But one of the things that I'm learning is, and it's a very common complaint, is People, parents, in regard to litigation, first of all, often do not find an attorney that who is truly qualified, that does not share with you the game plan on how they're going to manage your case. Because when I'm brought into a case, I always explain to everybody, the attorney is the case manager, not me. Okay, You need a game plan. And the other thing you need is you've got to be prepared to hit them hard fast. Otherwise, you're going to get nickeled and dimed to death. And that is what I frequently hear. I'm amazed how many people will come to me. They spend 20, 30, 40, on a couple occasions, $100,000 trying to, do, you know, to resolve their case. And, and, and part of it is because they get nickeled and dimed. I think that when, you know, you have a right when you're talking to an attorney to ask questions and to get an understanding, and even after that initial consult, to say, OK, what is our game plan? And then you can make a judgment on whether or not that makes a whole lot of sense. OK? But you have to, I think, be prepared to act fast and with a punch if you really suspect alienation. And actually, you know, if you think about it, you've seen these behaviors long before divorce court. You've seen the behaviors of control, denigration, you know, power struggles. You see the, the makings. Because the one thing that is very important to keep in mind 
especially if you're dealing with personality disorders, which a lot of alienating parents are, not all of them, but a good number of them are, when they're under stress, their pathology gets worse. It doesn't get better. And if they have a personality disorder, ironically, you might be seeing the best of them at the time when the decision is made to separate as compared to months and even years later. You start to see things that you could never have imagined you would have seen in your ex-spouse. I mean, a lot of times, and I'm sure other people would share this, that when you hear these stories, you know, the question that comes to your mind is, how did you marry this person in the first place? <laughs> you know, I mean, and that's a legitimate question, but I think sometimes we learn that love does not always equate good judgment. So uh, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, one of the big frustrations, and we hear this here, is that we find ourselves in a stalemate. What I mean by that is you have two opposing sides, nothing seems to be going anywhere, continuances, continued court cases, uh, continued schedules uh, of delays, and, and it just sort of just keeps going. And I've always said, you know, one of the things that I would really like to educate judges about is do not allow for frivolous continuances on cases. That is about the most damaging thing that you can do to children. But it is so easy to happen. Anyway, these parents, and we've heard a lot of who they are, they rationalize their behavior. They don't see themselves as doing anything wrong. In fact, most often they believe that somehow in their distorted way of thinking, they're protecting the child. Uh, they will often say, I know what's best, and no court is going to tell me otherwise. These people very often are not intimidated by the judicial system. And they're very comfortable in um, uh, refusing to adhere to court orders. Part of the difficulty is that often courts don't have the chutzpah to follow through with their orders in terms of any kind of consequences. Myself and Dr. Barb Steinberg a number of years ago, because both of us had done quite an extensive amount of evaluations and studies over the years and we kind of save everything. I got boxes and boxes of uh, you know, reports and documents. And we wanted to ask the question, how does reunification occur with a severely alienated child? We wanted to understand that. Because when I wrote my first book, I was very pessimistic. I mean, the whole theme of the book is recognize parental alienation before it gets to PAS. It's like a cancer, and you've got to intervene immediately, because otherwise there's no hope. OK? Well, things are a little more positive, because we find that unification does occur. But we want to understand, how does it happen? So we went back on our cases, and we did some interviews and looked at data, at, because a number of these people over time have contacted us one way or another. And we found a common denominator. And the common denominator was that from the child, who very often then became an adult, they had a crisis. There was a crisis in their life, and somehow they saw an advantage to reaching out to the alienated or targeted parent. Now, that was very interesting because we're still trying to develop paradigms in terms of how to intervene with high conflict cases. And it's still evolving. We, we don't have a standard of care as such, though and the standard of care is kind of evolving. But it's being challenged. It's being corrected, uh, 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 well, challenged and, and uh, I blocked on the word. Um, criticized, but that's the nature of science, okay? Science, the whole scientific process is dependent upon criticism, uh, strict review, critical analysis, that's normal, okay? Well, sometimes to, to get new paradigms, we have to step outside of the box. We have to look at other areas in our life. 
And so I did this, and what I found was a number of models that came out of political science. Anyway, sometimes we have to look outside the box, and what I was doing is I was looking at political science because we have seen in our history severe conflict between nations. I mean, we see this today. And we've also seen where there has been some reconciliation and some discussion and people trying to work together. So how does that happen? Why does that happen? Now, there's even examples in fiction. For an example, and I'm kind of showing my age, and I guess the people that are going to raise their hand are going to have to acknowledge they're old. But how many of you ever seen the original Day the Earth Stood Still? The Day the Earth Stood Still. With Michael Redding, exactly. What was the theme of the story? You had all of these countries, and here comes the guy from Mars saying that your hostilities, your wars, is starting to spill over into the universe, and if you don't stop it, we're going to destroy you. What did they start doing? We better start talking to each other, okay? Because there was a crisis. When we see things, uh, like for an example, one of the, the fun things about huge snowstorms, you know, like the 20-inch ones, you know, and everything stops, people come out and start talking to each other. <laughs> they want to help each other because it's a shared crisis. We saw that in Katrina, okay? We saw that in the movie of Independence Day. It's a very real phenomena that people will talk to each other in crisis. Well, through the research, that's me, um, I have here the, the, the uh, uh, characteristics. These, these are the characteristics we looked at, Barb and I, when we were identifying the high conflict cases, where there was the alienated child adult, there was a campaign of litigation, protracted in, uh, litigation, critical parenting. I did a factor analysis study, and the one thing that really is not talked about in the research but came out very strong in the research that's described in my book is that in alienating cases, there is a lot of critical or criticism about the other parent's parenting style. That's a very common characteristic you see in alienating families. You also, again, see the belief system, the sense of entitlement, and I know better than anybody else, and they have a rigid mindset. I don't want to go into a lot of detail because you guys have been hearing a lot about this, different characteristics. But anyway, so what I was looking at is for motivational models. One of them is what's called a herding stalemate. I'll describe that in a minute. Um, recent uh, catastrophes, that brings people together. Impending ca ca uh, cast, ca uh, thank you, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and enticing opportunities. Okay, now, what is a herding stalemate? This is what we see. Basically what it is, it's a situation where both parents have to come to the realization that they're in a no-win situation, and if they persist in their position, they're going to hurt the child. Now, when you're talking about trying to change beliefs and trying to create crisis, because we're going to talk about how to create crisis, the crisis always has to be in the context that you are hurting children. Okay, because even the severely alienated person who has all these defenses and all of these rationalizations will say, I don't want to hurt the children, okay? In fact, in my therapy, I've got notebooks and notebooks of case studies where I can literally show these parents and let me say, look at the research and what's happening and what's going to happen with your children if this behavior persists. This isn't coming from me. This is well-documented research. Children are going to be hurt. Where this really came to my attention is I had a young man, big, strong, burly guy, about 28, and he came to me for depression. And he was sitting in my office, and as he was starting to describe while he was there, his whole body started to tremble. I mean, he was so upset. And he described how his mother had alienated him from his father, and he had had no contact with his father for a good number of years. He saw a, a reason, I'm not sure what the crisis was, but he reached out to his father and reestablished a relationship, and then his father died, okay? 
He did not know how to contain his anger and bitterness towards his mother. That was the treatment issue. He did not know how to do that. And the point in that story is that alienating parents have to really understand that this whole thing can come back at you and haunt you and destroy your relationship with your child for the rest of your life. But see, these people get so deluded in their belief that they can't believe that that could happen. But it does, in fact, happen. So anyway, um, circumstances occur where sometimes parents have to make joint decisions. And if they fail to cooperate, like with certain kinds of medical treatment, uh, sign releases or whatever, it could ultimately hurt the child. Um, this is examples of recent catastrophes where you can experience something and yet it can bring people together because it's a shared catastrophe. Uh, you know, for an example, we're seeing about the floods in Fargo, North Carolina. Okay, now we know there's a lot of divorced people there. Conceivably, there's people who may not have been able to relate with each other, but all of a sudden have to come together and work together, maybe even when they have a common child. And by the way, let me say this, that, that these, uh, th these different theories have not been tested. Okay, this is still hypothesis in, in regard to dealing with high conflict cases. Um, example of uh, a young man, his parents were very, very wealthy. Uh, the boy wanted nothing to do with um, a father. And the boy it was during the winter in, in the hills of Virginia, and the father, you know, was on the board of the country club. And this young man thought it would be kind of cool to get on the snowmobile and drive all over the golf course. Anyway, he just tore up the golf course. He was now in big trouble. Who can help him? Maybe I better call dad because <laughs> he's on the board. And he did. That was the crisis. He reached out to father saying, I now need him. Okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about what to do when they reach out. But the key to dealing or responding to crisis really is timing. Okay? And we're going to talk about that. Impending uh, uh, catastrophe. Uh, I've seen a number of times when reunification occurred where the biological parent and the step parent got divorced. And then for whatever reason, the child felt they had to reach out to the biological parent because they anticipated a lot of disruption in the family. They anticipated there was going to be a lot of conflict, a lot of anger. They could get tied into the litigation, and they thought they needed to reach out to the uh, other parent. Um, Again, uh, enticing opportunity could be the, 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 the young person having to reach out because they're needing assistance in terms of getting into college or technical school. Uh, perhaps there's a financial windfall. In other words, there's a major circumstances that is motivating the child to have to reach out. Now, I don't want to get into obstacles for change because that's in my book and that's kind of lengthy. Um, The study that uh, the Barber and I did, you know, it had 27 child adults. Uh, at the time of the alienation, it was anywhere from the age of 4 to 17. And this was published in um, the American Journal of Family Therapy. Uh, the average length of time or the range of time where the um, targeted parent um, was uh, denied any access was uh, th uh, from three months to nine years. And um, three of the rejected parents were mothers and 24 were fathers. 14 were males and 13 were females. That was of the children who reached out. Um, nine were the oldest, three were the middle child, 12 were the youngest child, one was the only child. Okay. Uh, now, when we're looking at kind of new paradigms, new models, I'm going to kind of go off on a little sidetrack here, but I think the point I want to make is we can learn how to deal with conflict from a lot of very unusual sources if we're open to it. How many of you have watched The Dog Whisperer? Okay, don't be embarrassed by saying you did it, watched it, okay? 
because the next one's even worse. But anyway, interesting about the dog whisperer, this is a guy, Caesar, he just became an American citizen. Uh, he was brought in to families who dealt with very aggressive, misbehaved dogs. You know, the dogs that if you take them on the walk, that dog will try to attack anything that's on the sidewalk. And some of you know what I'm talking about, okay? A uh, very common experience, and, and his job is to come in and, in effect, rehabilitate these animals, okay? Well, the one theme that he uses in this rehabilitation is, as a dog owner, a trainer, what is the energy that you're conveying to the dog, okay? Are you conveying fear, anger, you know, uh, uh, annoyance, and in effect, he's saying that's what the dog is picking up on, and that's what the dog is responding to, and they will feel that energy without you even opening your mouth, because they have that capacity to do that. Now, I think of getting together with high-conflict parents. I will ask you, when you're exposed, if you're exposed, not only to the other parent, but even perhaps to the child. What is the energy that you're emitting to that other person? And it's very possible that that energy is what that other person is responding to, that is adding to the problem. And someone said earlier, and I totally agree, that when we get towards reunification, when we're trying, even during the whole court process, even during the separation process, we have to be very cognizant of the energy that we're conveying to the other person, and we have to control that. We have to contain that, because they could be reacting to that without you ever saying a word. And you know what, we're all like that. I mean, we've all been around people where we can pick up their energy and think, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with this person. I don't think I like this person. And sometimes we can do that before we even heard them speak, <laughs> okay? So that's one thing we learned from the dog whisperer. Now, how many of you, see, I'm, I'm trying to get you to kind of think beyond the box. How many of you have watched Dog the Bounty Hunter? Yeah, yeah, I'll see. <laughs> okay. Don't like to admit it, you know, but very interesting thing if you haven't seen Dog the Bounty Hunter. Now, this is a big, burly guy with tattoos and long blonde hair, and he's got his whole family in this thing. And his job in Hawaii is uh, picking up pro uh, probation, parole violators, you know, who are out on bond and they're skipping bond, and he's bringing them in because, you know, they, they get a percentage of the money. Very interesting thing about this guy. They'll catch these people. Sometimes they have to take them down on the ground. Sometimes they got to get physically rough with them. And then they get them into the SUV, and they're sitting in the back seat, and there's dog on one side and someone else on the other side. And here's this prisoner in the middle. What's interesting, now this is a very adversarial situation, OK? By the time they get done, most of the time, these people, the criminals, are hugging them and thanking them. And you think, my God, how do they do that? OK, that's phenomenal. OK? Well, let me tell you how they do it. Because I've actually tried it in therapy. <laughs> OK? See, you can learn things from many different sources. It's, you, know, you, you, you know, life is full of experiences. And, and be open to them. What they do is they start talking to the person. And first of all, they talk to them with respect. Very calm voice. That there is not that hostile energy. And basically, what they start talking about is the fact that however bad you are, there are people out there that love you. There are people who are looking up to you for guidance and are going to be worried about you tonight. And he gets them talking about the love. You know, you may have done some bad things, but that doesn't negate the fact that, like anybody else, you are being loved. You have people who are dependent on you. You're going to have to look at your mother in the eye and say, Mom, Dad, I might have to go to prison. You may have to say to your children, 
and again, I'm putting this in the context of the criminal thing, that I'm going to be gone a while, and even though I loved you, I'm going to have to leave you. Okay? Now, even as I'm describing that, think of the energy that conveys and how that helps to bring about a rapport. Because even the, the worst parent believes, or the fact is, someone out there loves them. Someone does care about them. Someone doesn't want to see them go through all this. You know? And sometimes we have to try to tap into the tenderness and to kind of acknowledge that. If for no other reason, to help establish a rapport. Because when, when we're doing evaluations, and I strongly believe this, our job is to gather data. And we follow the data, and we don't know where it's going to take us. We should, anybody who has an idea where the data is going to take us during the first interview, run. Because they should not know the answer to that question. And as you're doing this, yes, you develop hypothesis, and you have to look at alternative hypothesis other than just parental alienation. In fact, one of the differences in the new book is I talk a lot more about estrangement issues, which I really didn't talk about in the first book, because those things have to be considered. But anyway, um, that's sort of a sideline. So anyway, the, the point that I'm making is that we can learn from a lot of people. And you know, very rarely, when I have a new family, I'm learning something from you all. Sometimes things that I never even thought of. Sometimes you are educating me. You are educating me every time I see a response to whether it's an effective response and whether I should have handled things a little differently. Interviewing high conflict cases as well as cases dealing with abuse is a very um, specific uh, art. It's a talent. Uh, there's very definite protocols. And actually, when you were listening to some of the people here, you, you heard a lot of very proper type of questions. Because what you're doing during the assessment is you want to hear that person's story. And one of the most common interventions is, can you tell me more or help me to understand? You want them to evolve that story in their own words. And part of that is being com getting them comfortable. And, um, and that's even a two-edged sword, because sometimes they will equate being comfortable with you, believing that somehow you're on their side. And then if it turns out your evaluation is not supporting their position, they feel very betrayed. So they have to be really kind of careful with that. Now. There's a lot of models that says crisis can bring about change. One of the most common models is with alcohol and substance abuse, called an intervention. Because the theory is, is that if you're going to bring about change, change will occur when people are in pain. But it has to be pain as a consequence of them looking at themselves rather than you sitting there making accusations towards them. They have to, and in some ways, they also have to kind of develop an empathy you know, for the children or the people that they're hurting. But they're going to only focus on the children. Courts can create crisis if they got the guts to do it. And I'm going to give you some examples, true life examples. I don't know what my time is. Uh, I was doing an evaluation, and part of the evaluation was entering, uh, interviewing this little seven-year-old. And one of the questions I often ask uh, early in the uh, interview is I say, you know, sometimes mommy and daddy get a little bit nervous when you come here, because I was doing this in the court. And they want to help you, you know, in terms of what you may or may not say. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, was, was there any help, you know, before coming today? And this little gal, oh, she's about six or seven, as innocent can be, she said, oh, yeah, yeah. Last night, my mother pretended to be you. And she was asking questions. And you know, when things are very hard, I don't remember. So she was helping me with my memory. OK? And I'm sitting there thinking, OK. <laughs> OK. Well, it became court time. And uh, I was on the witness stand, and here was a woman judge sitting next to me. And I, in response to a question, conveyed the story. The judge blew a gasket, absolutely furious. 
Now, uh, up to this point, father had no access to the child. Mother blocked every effort for him to see this kid. And he wasn't the most ideal kind of guy. He was kind of a cold, stoic, tough kind of guy. But he loved his daughter. The judge immediately sent them both to jail. <laughs> sent them right down to jail. And what was very interesting, because I was on the witness stand when this was happening, is that the father smiled because he knew what the judge was doing. Okay? Now, there was an important lesson in this thing. Um, let me, uh, I think these things are out of order because a lot of times when I speak, I kind of do things more off the top of my head. Um, anyway, he understood what was going on. Uh, the mother just fell apart and cried. She just bawled her eyes out. And uh, sure enough, the sheriff came, and, and this was unofficial. I mean, they weren't technically booked, but they were taken down to the county jail. And then about 4 o'clock towards the end of the day, because she wanted him to get a little bit nervous about, like, am I going to leave today, you know? And she brought him back, and, of course, she reprimanded him. And, and uh, from that point on, father got visitation. That, that was the, the end of that issue. Now, mother still didn't like father. You know, that didn't all of a sudden say, you know, gee, I'm sorry, you know, I want you to see. That didn't happen. But the important thing is he had access to his child so he can work on building that relationship. And that child was not afraid of father. She was not a PAS child, but she was clearly being alienated, you know. Um, but crisis brought about change. Why? Because she had the courage to do that. Another case. This was in Virginia, and this was a very interesting uh, courtroom. I don't, I don't know if any of you have seen this, even you attorneys. Uh, in this courtroom, the, the jury box sits in front of the judge facing out to the audience. You've seen that. I thought it was fantastic. In Kentucky? Yeah, it, it was really neat. And then the witnesses are standing in front of the jury box facing the judge. And so what it does is, like, when I'm testifying, I, I really feel like I'm talking to the judge, which is who I really want to talk to, more so than the attorneys, to be honest with you. But I don't have to twist my body around. I mean, I'm looking right at them. Anyway, this was um, a contentious divorce, and uh, the parents would not talk to each other. And this has been going on. They had continuances and all this stuff. In fact, I was asked to testify about parental alienation. And I did, and, and the judge, I, I like it when I have to testify and the judge starts asking me questions. I feel like, gee, this person's sincerely interested and I can, you know, educate the court. But he also at one point made the comment, he says, I don't know why you're here. I know about parental alienation. I mean, you're not telling me anything new. And I thought, that's fine, you know, but it, it put a focus on the case. But anyway, the judge called the two attorneys up to the bench. There were two children. And the judge said to the two attorneys, I want you to go out there in the hallway and talk to your client, and I want each one of you to come back with the name of, a, of a, a responsible, trusted adult, because I'm going to put the custody of the children in those adults' hands. These both parents are going to lose temporary custody. So they go on out, have their little talk. I'm sitting there on the witness stand thinking, gee, this is interesting. And by the way, this didn't come about because of my recommendation. This came on the part of the judge. And they come trotting back in and said, Judge, our people are talking to each other. <laughs> okay? I think we can work out an agreement in terms of access and all that. Again, he created a crisis. He had the courage to create a crisis. Now, there's some important things about this crisis, and that's what I want to find on this thing. Um, And I, I, okay, yeah, why that? Okay, the one thing about the crisis that I find that it needs to work is it has to affect both parents equally. If the one judge said on the first scenario to the mother, uh, I'm going to send you to jail and not the father, what do you think is going to happen? Mother's going to say, see what your dad did to me. She's going to use that as a weapon to further the alienation. So any consequence has to affect both parents equally. The other consideration is obviously the child's safety has to be of paramount importance. And that becomes, you know, obviously a, a judgment on the part of the judge making the order dependent upon the evidence that's coming in. 
but none of these scenarios was a threat to the judges, uh, to the safety of the child. And, and let me say this, and this kind of came up uh, in one of the discussions, and it's so true. When a case is brought to court, and I'm not an attorney, okay, but I've sat in a lot of courtrooms, and especially if there's what I call an a request for an involuntary change of custody, meaning that the other side is opposed to it and maybe the child's opposed to it. The standard, at least in Ohio, for making that decision is not the same as when you're going for initial custody. Because theoretically, like in Ohio, initial custody, both parents are on an equal playing field. Now we know that really isn't true if we look at the statistics, but that's the theory. When you're returning to court, it's not that criteria anymore. Even though they say best interest, that is really not the issue, okay? Because the issue that the judge has to do is they're gonna on one hand weigh the continuation of the status quo with the other hand, the risk as to what's gonna happen to the child if you have the change of custody. And they see that often as a risk that they don't wanna take. Would you agree with me, attorneys? Okay, yeah. So they're gonna take the more conservative view, and that is maintaining the status quo. And that's why when you're talking about uh, an involuntary change of custody, unless you really have a strong preponderance of the evidence, you have a very small chance of winning. Now it is true that sometimes judges or attorneys will use that to try to create leverage or to create a crisis in order to get movement in the case. And sometimes that does happen. In fact, sometimes, and I'm sure some of the people like Michael and, and some of these people who have been witnesses, expert witnesses, um, sometimes when we are brought into the court, that creates a crisis in the minds of the other side for fear of what we might have to say or do and I'm amazed how often I'll come to court and I don't even have to testify because our presence shakes the case loose, which from my point of view is wonderful because <laughs> I get paid and I don't have to do anything. Have you had that experience, Mike? It's fun, really, you know. You sit in the hallway, absolutely, bring a book, you know. Uh, but, but again, that, that's another form of, of crisis is, is it uh, creates anxiety. Um, Anyway, um, in, in creating this crisis, both parents ultimately have to see an advantage as to why they have to work together. In the first case, to keep the parents out of jail. The second case, uh, to maintain some level of custody. Um, the other important issue, and this is very hard, and this is why I'm bringing up this issue, the court cannot bluff the, severe, the alienating parent very often has no respect for the court, they don't believe the court's gonna follow up with any kind of sanctions, and they're willing to take their chances. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, especially with contempt, where you think, gee, the judge is gonna see this, they're gonna do something to sanction, and nothing happens. They say, hey, we want you to behave yourself, don't come back to court, and sure enough, you come back to court, okay? With crisis, it cannot be a bluff, and that takes courage on the part of the judge. And that's the one reason why I'm bringing up this whole issue, is to say, in effect, this can be a viable approach in terms of trying to break a stalemate. And I have not seen, I mean, I've heard other examples of breaking the stalemate, but I have not seen, and, and maybe other people can help me, where creating a crisis in this nature has ever harmed a child. It is kind of interesting, even when you get into an involuntary change of custody, uh, yeah, there's that initial, you know, everybody shook up and a little bit crazy, but I'm always amazed at how fast that kid ultimately moves into the other household. And they are capable of adjusting, okay? What we need is more data to show that to the courts that that in fact does happen, and it can happen with fairly good regularity. That's what the courts are wanting. But anyway, the judges cannot bluff. Timing is important. When, the, when you create the crisis, you have to act immediately. 
if the, if the judge in the first example said to the mother, I don't want you to do this anymore, or next week I'm going to send you to jail, it's like saying to a child, you know, I'm going to punish you next week instead of today. You, you lose all effectiveness. You have to act now. Timing is very important. And when we're talking about the different motivational models, again, timing is very important. Immediacy is important. Um, research has consistently shown, not in the context of parental alienation, but it has shown that people are more receptive to change when faced with a crisis. You see this with alcohol intervention. You see this in therapy on dealing with suicide, help hotlines. All of those different crisis intervention programs are all based on the premise that change is most likely to occur when in face of crisis. Okay? Now, um, when the court or anybody is creating a crisis, part of that crisis has to clearly spell out in behavioral terms the consequences of action or inaction. And again, the court has to follow through with those consequences. And the important thing is, and this is even true when you're relating with your children, that the consequences have to be addressed in a way of saying, you know what, this was your choice. It's not me doing this to you. This was your choice, you know, in terms of how you chose to act, and therefore you chose the consequences. Now, you know, we're all off on time, and I'm trying to be sensitive to that. When we were looking at, um, the 27 studies, or the cases, you know, the, again, the, the purpose of the study was uh, to try to understand how any kind of level of uh, reunification occurred. And like I said, the common denominator was they were in a crisis. In fact, I was talking to the young lady over here about the theory, and she said, you know what, that's what happened to me. It was a crisis that created change. Um, anyway, um, we found that of the 27 cases, nine cases truly had a positive reunification where the parent, the alienating parent and the child were able to sustain a positive long-term relationship, okay? And I think that's very hopeful. And I think parents, many of you, need to know that that, that kind of hope is out there. Another nine cases found improvement in the relationship where they were able to talk, but there really wasn't that emotional closeness. There was a comfort level, but it wasn't really close. And I understand that because my parents were divorced and my father moved to Spokane, Washington. He had tuberculosis and I lived with my mother. In those days, no one ever asked me where I wanted to go, but let me tell you, it was the right choice. Um, and then years later, my father called up and said, hey, I'd like to see you. And so we kind of reunified, not because of alienation, I think it's more because he just disappeared. Uh, but there really was not that parent-child bond, okay? We were able to talk. In fact, my brother, who was five years younger, because my mother was remarried at this time, my brother came to me and said, what do I call him? Do I call him dad? You know, I mean, he, he didn't know how to act, you know? And I said, well, yeah, if that's what you're comfortable with. And I have to admit, it was even awkward for me to call him dad, you know. But he was our dad. And he was a nice guy. He was a happy drunk, but he was a nice guy. No abuse or anything like that. Um, but, uh, but the important thing I learned is that, that bond that we think of, like the old uh, Salem commercials where people are running across the field and they want to hug and all that stuff, you know, it wasn't there. Okay, but that was still a degree of success, okay? And then there were nine cases where they really did not sustain any kind of relationship. Not out of hostility, you know, one boy said that, uh, that he saw really no reason to keep the relationship with his father because it wasn't worth the trouble. You know, it was more trouble than it was worth. He wasn't angry, he wasn't hostile, he just, you know, could care less. Um, but the important thing was is that that appeared to be mutual decisions between the parent and the, and the child, okay? And I could live with that. Um, so I thought that this study, even though it has a, a limited sample size, it may be hard to generalize, but it, what it does say is that there is hope out there, okay? And not to give up that hope. Now, it raises a couple of other little questions. Well, what did I learn? There's hope. Crisis can bring about change. 
Oh, and by the way, the reunification, uh, to whatever degree with these 27 cases, did not involve mental health counseling or court intervention. I think that's important. This is something they chose to do for whatever reason on their own. It wasn't because Barbara and I did this miraculous thing in therapy and fixed everything. That didn't happen, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and also reunification has different meanings for the child as opposed to the parent. Uh, reunification, yeah, I already said that. Um, there are do's and don'ts for successful reunification. I want to kind of summarize that and then we're going to kind of get questions here. Um, well, we're not getting anywhere. What? Oh, really? Oh, then I have to go back, I guess. But I, okay, well, let me, let me share some things here. If there's any hope for reunification in the future, there are things as a parent that you need to do to be prepared. Some of these things have already been talked about. One is, it's very logical that that child needs to always know how to get a hold of you, even if they chose not to, whether it's through internet, you know, knowing your address or what. They have to know how to get a hold of you. Secondly, and it's absolutely imperative, and you've heard this, continue with the cards, continue to acknowledge holidays. Even if the, 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 the stuff comes back to you in the mail, save it, because one thing that is very important for children that are involved in reunification is they have to believe that you did not forget about them, that you did not abandon them, because now you're creating new issues. So you're better off by sending the cards, Christmas, holidays, birthdays, and, and, and keep a log of that, keep a record of that, okay? Don't worry so much as to whether or not they actually received it, okay? But I've seen many kids, when they're kind of involved in the reunification thing, saying to the parent, you know, why didn't you, you know, send me a Christmas present or a card or something? Presents and cards are very symbolic. They have an importance, okay? And I'm going to emphasize this, okay? A symbol is any object or behavior that has a, a, a value beyond its intrinsic value, okay? For an example, I'm going to use this sweet little lady over here, okay? Yeah, you. <laughs> Let's pretend that you're my wife. Anytime. God darn, I, 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 I've got it made. And I say to you, you know, sweetheart, I was coming home today and I was thinking about, you know, stopping in at uh, Adgates or one of these places. And I wanted to get you a rose to kind of let you know how much I love you, okay? And then I got thinking about, you know, it's winter and the rose and all that stuff's going to die. Can I just give you the $2? <laughs> okay. What is wrong with that? It doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. No, because the rose is a symbol. Uh, Hallmark cards created a whole industry based on symbolism. And this is true for children. We have to respect and acknowledge those symbols, even if they're somehow rejected. So don't forget to do that. The one thing that will absolutely destroy any chance of reunification is if you approach reestablishing this relationship with the idea that you have to convince your child that your experience and your story about what happened is the correct story and they are wrong. You're going to wipe out any chance because the kid will just immediately shut down on you. Okay? Whether they're right or wrong is not the issue. You know, the issue is you want to reestablish and build a relationship and you can forget about the idea that that child is ever going to agree with your point of view. Okay? So let me quit here so the next person, because they got to catch a flight or someplace and then I can come back for questions, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So anyway, thank you, and we'll be back. Again, thank you, 
Dr. Doug Darnell for coming all the way from the great state of Ohio to be with us today. Thanks again. I'd like to introduce Mr. Vernon Beck, who is a child and family advocate with Canada Court Watch. Vern is um, uh, a mediation uh, expert with uh, Family Conflict Resolution Services. He's been involved with advocacy since 1995. Currently involved in helping children and families out with family court matters. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Vernon Beck. <laughs> 